we record it and you'll get a link uh, to the webinar afterwards. Uh, these are all available from our redgate.com uh, database lifecycle management homepage and all the past recordings are up there as well. Um, we want to make this webinar as interactive as possible, so please use the questions panel in the GoToWebinar um, control panel throughout. We would like to answer your questions throughout and make this as interactive as possible. Today we'll be talking about database version control. Is this optional or required? And we have special guests Justin Deering, Elizabeth Iyer from Redgate, and I'm your host, Stephanie Herr. Today's webinar is sponsored by Redgate's SQL Source Control. This is an add-in into the SQL Server Management Studio that allows you to source control your database using your existing source control systems like Git, TFS, Subversion, or any other source control system. If you stay on for the end of the webinar, we'll have a 10-minute demonstration from one of the developers on the team to uh, let you see how SQL Source Control works. Today, uh, we'll spend the first five minutes having an introduction to our speakers, uh, and then we'll go into a panel discussion about database version control, uh, followed by Q&A at the end. But really, we want to make this as interactive as possible, so please ask your questions throughout so that we can answer them um, as we're discussing the topic. So I'm your host, Stephanie Herr. I'm a product manager at Redgate, and I've also been the project manager for SQL Source Control version 1, 2, and 3. So this is a very uh, dear topic to me. Um, we also have Justin, who's an independent consultant and developer. Justin, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, yeah, so I guess I've been dealing, uh, so lately I've been actually dealing with a lot of PHP and DB2, but I've been spending a good decade doing .NET and SQL Server also talk to SQL Server from a bunch of other languages like R on Linux, uh, and uh, I'm very passionate about integrating the uh, database schema um, in, into, uh, you know, into source control, uh, just like I've been dealing with all my code in, in .NET and PHP and Python and the various other languages I use. Great, thank you. And. We also have Elizabeth on the line, a product manager at Redgate. Redgate uh, Elizabeth, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, um, as you say, I'm a product manager here at Redgate. I've been here seven years, and my background before that is as a developer um, of the application and database. And so, uh, yeah, uh, again, this is a, an area which is very dear to my heart as well about shipping software and making sure that we get you know, the best, the best versions we can out in the best possible way. So, yeah. Uh, both as a product manager and as a product manager for the specific area of Redgate, uh, it's an area of constant interest and uh, an area where I've been talking to quite a lot of people outside of Redgate as well and kind of aggregating what I'm seeing out there in the marketplace going on on this. Yeah, Elizabeth's known around Redgate for her key phrase of ship it and trying to get products out the door quickly uh, and just continuously improving upon them. So. Thank you guys both for joining us today, um, and yeah, that just lets us get right into our topic about database version control, optional or required. So I guess first, we should talk about some of the benefits uh, that version control can bring to the database. Um, Justin, can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. I mean, so obviously, uh, if, if you're writing a piece of software that's, that's talking to a database, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna make changes to the code. You're gonna get new requirements that require schema changes, and and you should have in source control, especially you know at, at a point of a release tag, um, a particular bunch of SQL scripts to build the database and, and populate with your test data, and a bunch of source code that all go together and, and create one working app. You know, you shouldn't sit there and, and depend on this. You know, okay, I can check out you know a particular version or the current work version of the code, and, and I need to go grab a back up of the database, but oh, did the database run, or, or does is there, you know, personal identifiable information, and I, you know, as a developer, I'm not supposed to have access to that. Um, you know, you, sh you should just be able to grab all that and do one quick build uh, from, from, from source control. Elizabeth, anything to add about benefits of, of source controlling your database? Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, you can think of it in terms of benefits, or you can look at it in terms of the problems that it's actually solving for people. And I guess the thing that triggers people we've interacted with, people we see to take it up, isn't that they're conscious of the benefits, it's they've had some more critical issue that they're trying to solve with the development process. So whether that's 
you know, consistency of sharing changes across developers, so actually fixing broken communication workflows of changes or you know, or making sure that you have some previous versions of things to go back to in the database without doing full restores. I mean, some issues like that where you know you run into a problem that you actually need to fix rather than necessarily yeah. looking at it in terms of the overall benefits that it's going to bring to your process, even though it clearly does. I guess, you know, I, I wonder if, if you know, the, the place to start is even looking at those um, yeah, the benefits in the context of what are those critical things that, that get people going on it. So what are some of the problems that you've seen? Well, I mean, you know, like, like I said about, I guess the one that, that I see most um, where developers are trying to put systems like this in place are, are issues of sharing changes among different developers and trying to make sure that you're working on consistent versions. So like you were saying, Justin, about being able to grab the right version of a database to go with the application, which is a surprisingly difficult problem to know, you know, what actually corresponds to what and make sure things are actually going to work. What about uh, code re what about code reviews? Do you think uh, that the up to your thing? That that was one thing I, I, I saw where you'd want to do like a full stack code review, go all the way down to um, you know, look at you know, look at your app and look at the database, you know, your stored procedure as well. Yeah, and being able to view those in a kind of comprehensive way. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that yeah, that, that that those are some of the like you say, the additional benefits that you get once you put something in place, although yeah, the lack of, no, I, I, I guess I have seen that of, you know, code reviews that take a long time to be able to figure out what we're even looking at together. Great. Um, and Justin, when you were talking, you kind of mentioned um, this one application and, and one database and being able to track changes, um, which uh, I guess we've come across as a very simplified um, example sometimes because there could be multiple applications uh, talking to the same database or, or one application that goes across multiple databases. Have you run into this and, and how does version control help with this? Um, yeah, so I mean I've been at, so, so one place we were kind of just uh, this real big SOA kind of app, um, you know, where, where it actually started out uh, way before I got on as PHP talking to SQL Server, and then it slowly evolved into PHP front end talking to a bunch of, um, you know, uh, WCF SOAP services talking to the database, and then you had a kind of BlackBerry and other mobile and other things talking to that same set of middleware. So uh, the the thing there is, is there was yeah there was a bunch of apps they were all kind of achieving the same it was it was all part of one um, uh, application one, one part one one and user application from the end user view. So uh, the advantage there, everything was in one big source control tree. Everything got branched when we were, you know, everything got branched and, and, and merged kind of as a whole when we, we went to do our releases. So that still was a simplified model. Um, the less, actually, uh, one of the, the, the more recent places I was at, it was uh, we kind of had these databases which came from, from R&D and, and were used for our main product, but we wrote a bunch of these one-off products. And there, that's when, yeah, I, I don't have a answer to how we really solved it, other than you know we would I, I would try to store just my schema changes in in source control and and do other other tricks there. That's where when I think the problem is not completely solved when when you have to maybe share a database or you're just having you know a different schema or subset of tables that your app is dealing with. Uh, that that's where things get hairy and you can't just say oh we'll just use SSDP or, or or, or the Red Gate source control tools, or whatever, and, and that that's where we really have to find some, um, you know, that's where things get customized. And I wish I had a good answer other than it's complex. <laughs> it's right, right. So, I mean, we're talking about this being optional or required. Um, how have you seen the adoption of, of people starting to source control their database? Is this something that's growing and, and no longer becoming optional, or? Um, it's definitely growing, um, but we certainly see lots of applications which still don't have anything for this in place. And I think that, yeah, the, 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 the biggest thing out there right now is half-hearted, cobbled together tools that do part of the job. Um, you know, so I, I think that the, the growing, um, uh, the, the, the improvement in tooling is actually, you know, sort of taking up so that people are solving this problem for real a bit more. But I think, yeah, we still see people who have nothing real in place for it. I don't know, does that does that make it still optional or or not? I don't know what you call that. Um, yeah, I, I think what it is because the tools are better, people are 
Well, I think a lot of people weren't doing it because the tool didn't make it obvious. Now that you have, you know, SSDT, for example, on, in the Microsoft world that says, okay, here's a simple way where every table, every object has a file that looks exactly like, you know, my classes and my app level where you know, every component has its own file and, and here's the thing where deploying it, it will do a, you know, you know, compile that to and dip it to what, what exists in reality in my, uh, in, in, in my database. Um, I think that made it easier, okay, so yeah, the problem is easier to solve in the default mode, and I think it's always been necessary, you just couldn't do it and you lived without it, and now the tools are catching up to let you do what you know you always wanted to do, and, 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 and you know, it, it, it's getting where we know we should be because we have the model on what works in, in application land, uh, you know, and, and the database people just got to catch up now that we have tools to let them, you know, to, to, to unify that. Yeah, that said, as, as you've pointed out before, it's still not easy enough that it's just a no-brainer the way source control is, and so there's still a little ways to go yet, but we're on that path now. I think it's you know, kind of inevitable. Yeah. So one of the things we hear from um, database developers, database administrators, is that they have a backup of their database. So why should I be putting you know, my, my database in source control if I need to get back to a, a previous state, you know, that, that's in my backup. And, you know, my backups are a very important process in our organization. So, you know, we, we use backups. Why do I have to put it in source control? Um, well, a backup is pretty big. If you're doing a release every week and you need to be able to roll back to a certain point as part of some kind of audit, do you want to, like, you, you probably throw out your backup that for a certain point because they're, they're so so massive, you know, you probably keep, you keep certain backups for seven years for tax purposes in, in, in the U.S. You keep, you know, um, you make sure you can restore to certain points, um, but do you, do you really want to have that burden of, oh, I want to release once a week, do I want to keep that when uh, storing in source control is just a schema, is a, lot, is a lot smaller. And also, you know, are you in a situation, you know, I've, I've, you know, you're not always in a situation where do you want the developer to have access to the backup of the production, you know, database. Um, yeah, and it doesn't solve most of the problems that you actually get with source control. Well, how do you know who changed what, right? You just you've lost all that with taking a backup, or you you ask that that in some other system that again you have to have something else still to give you that traceability on it, and you you've lost all ability, or you rather you don't actually gain anything for sharing changes or you know identifying changes with tickets, you know, things like that about the management of change through your system. You just you don't get any of that benefit even though you do have that ability to get back to previous versions. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. I mean, another, you know, another point is sometimes something weird, you know, why is there a trigger on, on this table? You know, we don't want triggers. Maybe just if we have that comment, um, you know, in source control, that answers that question. And at the very least, we know, we, we know who just, you know, go and blame for putting the trigger on the database or putting that, uh, you know, weird, you know, triple, you know, the, the, non, the cluster uh, GUID or whatever. You know, we, it's, it's another investigation tool. Um, you know, it, it, another tool in the investigation toolbox. Yeah, maybe saying who to blame, who to, who to go talk to, to uh, try to understand what they were doing and try to help them uh, do it the right way. Um, I guess also, if we're, if we're thinking about DBAs, sometimes there's a separation of the DBAs that are kind of just responsible for the production database. Um, so why should they care about what their developers you know, do with the with the development database uh, be, before they actually get the script to run on production. Well, it's a question of do you actually want your script to run in production reliably? You know, I mean, all, the developers have the best chance to be testing it all the way through, all the way through those production environments, and if you get it, you know, as, as matched up as possible. So the developers, you know, talking ideal world a little bit here, but if they can have environments that match production closely and you're actually taking changes through in the same way that it's going to be made to production, then you get a huge amount more confidence that you have te properly tested this change. So it's all very well deviate kind of doing that in one environment, but if you get the benefit of an entire group of people having done that over the course of its development, um, yeah, I, I, if I were a DBI, I'd care. Maybe you can say, Justin, whether you think that's worth caring about. Um, is, I, I think that, that that is worth you know carrying out having that trip. But the other thing uh, to deal with um, the the one thing where I, I think we're we're never going to get past contrasting a, a database to an application is sometimes things on production and dev will be different, and there's no way to capture that in like an app config the way I can as a um, developer. So and sometimes operational changes will happen. Indexes we put on to production that that that, that deal with the reality of how the query plan looks there or or, or 
whatever you change from full to simple recovery model. So it's actually important, even if you're using source, uh, uh, you know, more of a source control tool, you still have to do like a, you know, a, a schema compare with, with, you know, red gate or SSDT or whatever, and you still have to go back. You have to do a two-way thing when you compare, you know, compare stuff because there will be differences that will be captured outside of even the tightest, most controlled uh, deployment cycle, you know. So being aware of those changes made to production. Yeah. Um, right, right. Yeah. We have some questions coming in, um, one from David. Uh, how can version control help rollback changes that modify data? I mean, there's kind of a, a, I suppose there are different answers to this depending on what um, mechanism you decide to use for your version control. And we haven't gotten into the great debate about whether to, you know, whether one will want to version scripts or one would actually want to version you know, the current state of the database has designed. Uh, but I mean, an easy answer is if you're actually mod source controlling your scripts, then making sure you check in down scripts for up scripts, you, you, you can at the time capture what you think the way path back is. Um, yeah, um, I mean, uh, that's the thing where, you know, how far back can you go where you can really go down if you're talking about data changes. I mean, if you add a column, um, obviously, and you say, well, here's the default for that column, that simple enough drop the column, all that data goes away. Um, if you sit there and, um, you know, I, I guess at one point Stack Overflow changed how the point tallied on their their, their answers, and they had to run a big database script to, to recalculate all the points because uh, the final points were, were denormalized. Um, that might be something where you can at some point go back in time and point of change. But, yeah, when you're changing data, like, it's it sometimes like, that that really is just a one way, one way thing, you know. That that that, that you, you can't do without a full backup, and you know that you know you, you you can try to do it, but you have to. You know, sometimes the ideal, you know, there's the ideal world, and and uh, you say this is this is something we can't solve with source control. Maybe maybe that's the thing you can't solve. Right, right, and you still need a a DBA to get involved and understand what data has gone in, you know, since that deployment, and and what you want to do with that data. Um, yeah. So Elizabeth, you brought up a really good point that we haven't even had this uh, this great debate yet of um, what what are people actually putting in source control? Um, could you talk a little bit more about these these two options of using a state based approach or a migration based approach? Sure, I guess they're just two different perspectives on what you want to keep in version control. Whether you actually want to sort of keep a snapshot of the database schema, at, you know, as it is at a point in time, or whether you want to reconstruct a sequence of migrations that actually led up to that schema. And I mean, the choice is that you know, you could make that decision for on lots of different factors. I guess the most often I've seen people make that decision based on what they currently do today, so that they match their process, you know, of what they version control to just what their existing ad hoc things look like today. Um, but there, there are different reasons you might want to make that decision. But yeah, so that, but broadly, um, you can either capture the state, and by state of it, it, it's just create scripts, and then tools can help you manage the differences between those things as you go up versions. And both SSDT and Redgate SQL Source Control work this way. Um, or you can actually manage each individual change script, and lots of the open source tools work this way. ReadyRoll works this way, um, in order to, to just put into version control the actual SQL that runs uh, as you're going forwards. And yeah, there's just two different options about how you'd want to approach it. So the migration space is kind of those upgrade scripts. Uh, yeah, exactly. Each one is, is a delta, is an upgrade from one you know known version to another version, and one single change that you're trying to make going forwards. Justin, what have you seen people do? Uh, I, I, I see more of a of a hybrid approach. Is, is going with more you know state based. At, you know you, when you design stuff, you know here's my table, here's my stored procedure. Let me change those and 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 do that. And then uh, you know at at release time, you 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 know. You know, you push that through. Sometimes uh, you have to have insert script, you know, scripts to do inserts and updates that are more database to, to deal with the realities of, of you know, your tool's not going to capture how this schema change affects that. Um, so so you, you kind of you start with the state base, you add some kind of post-deploy scripts that are more migration solutions, and then you sit there and say, okay, let me, add, you know, when my, my, my tool is going to generate the migration script to go from the dev box to the QA box or whatever, and then I'm going to save those scripts, and then at deployment time when I go from like uh, you know from user acceptance to production, I'm going to compare the I'm going to compare those two scripts at each stage in the game, 
So I think you have to have a hybrid. You, you have to have a hybrid solution because the state-based solution is going to be the best thing that's going to get you. Let me check out something where I can build a greenfield, uh, the greenfield dev environment, um, and the migration-based solution is going to be the this is this is this is what I'm missing. Um, and you know, so so it, it, it's always going to be. Uh, well, if you're going to if you're going to start with if you're going to go with state based, you're always going to be a hybrid approach. If you do uh, state based, you're, I you're think gonna... that's a good point. And yeah, even you will materialize a script, and it it is kind of up to you whether you end up checking that back in version control again again or not. And so the the question about what goes in version control, yeah, it could be either. It could be a combination of both of them. That's that's true. It's not always a pure world. Yeah, I, I think it's important. I think it's very important to capture that script. Um, and you know, I I wish. SSTT, you know, did that. You know, I, I wish there was a better way to integrate uh, to capture what your SQL compare your post deploy SSTT script, uh, you know, in, in, into your into your project. I, you know, I, I hooks for that would be great, um, basically, because um, I have to do it manually currently to write my own hooks. <laughs> um, does it make a difference which version control system you're using? something. Sorry, did, did you want to jump in, Justin? No, let you go, go, go. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it makes a difference about what your process looks like and potentially what individual databases you're using, you know, to, to generate those scripts and, and put them in all that. So, yeah, I mean, it, your process will look a little bit different depending on whether you are, you know, heavily bought into distributed version control, for example, versus working off of a mainline, you know, single um, master your version going going through time. So it's not really a version control system. It's more about how you choose to use it and what you know what kind of branching and merging strategy you want to apply to it, which may correspond to the application or it may not. And that's yeah, you know, it's a decision for teams to make. Yeah, um I think your version control system does determine your culture a lot, or maybe your culture determines which version control you end up doing. But um yeah I think that that's more of a, a branching, you know, you know, discuss. You know, if you use TFS and if you use TFS and you use the, the GUI tools, you're gonna you're gonna lean towards the more Microsoft recommend. You know, old school branching, whatever. If you go with Git, you're gonna branch and merge every feature, and, and every code review will have a merge. And if you have no concept of, of like you know the workspace set or whatever, um, I think in the end you, I, I don't think it'll affect whether you go with state based or migration based or, or how much of your hybrid solution is. I I, I really think it's more. Uh, of of how you use branches for like code reviews and and stuff. I think that's that's where it is because I think I think every I think all the source control systems are going to want like atomic change um, atomic changes. I think your other tools more than whether you use Git or TFS are going to really determine um, more of your strategy because those determine um, you know how how well you can do state based and migration based stuff. I, I, I think. Yeah, I was just going to add that one other factor that we've seen is whether teams tend to share a development database and pull changes out of it into source control or whether they each have their own individual one. And honestly, you know, there's some combinations of these that don't work very well, so kind of heavy branching and, and on a shared database starts to get a little bit mind-blowing. Um, so, so, you know, certain things like that, certain combinations which may not work that well together, you know, so the, the question of how you choose to generate those changes in the first place, whether each developer has a kind of sandbox environment or whether you have some production-like shared thing that people are collaborating on, I think that that could inform your downstream choices about branching, certainly, um, or vice versa. You know, the, those decisions are related, at least, um, and you want to make decisions that are coherent across those two things. So I guess for someone like brand new to this that doesn't have their database in, in source control currently, are there any like recommendations for, for which branching strategy to follow or which mode this shared versus dedicated mode, or does it really all depend on you know their team and, and the way they currently work? Probably mostly depends. I'm looking up to Justin to see if he's dying to jump in on this. Um, I, I would have said it's easiest to get started if it kind of cor if it corresponds to your releases and you don't necessarily worry, you know, about the feature branching early on. If you if you try to if you're getting started, you try to take that to kind of a, a master and and at most a release branch and get those in place, and then try to work backwards potentially. I, I would have said that was a, a good way to try to bring that in. Yeah, I mean, I I think if, if you want to do it, I think you kind of got to just sit there and 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 you know just just kind of do it and and uh, 
you know, find, you know, you know, either, you know, reverse engineer a schema with SSDT or, you know, if you're in Postgres, you know, there, there are tools to do, you know, find the tool that will take your schema, give you one script per object, you know, and, 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 and integrate with your, your IDE or whatever, do that, and then sit there and then, okay, we have it in source control now in our branch, um, and now the developers want a branch for each feature, okay, you know, find one of the developers that, that's really good at Git or TFS or whatever you think, and, and kind of just, you know, seek them as the mentor of how, how do, you know, you want, you want to do this, this is how we work as DBAs, how do we work together, you know, you kind of just have to go and just decide to do it and then just work together to, to find that process for your, your thing, because if you, if you just do release branches in your organization and you don't do feature branches, there's no point in the, the DBA starting that unless that they, unless they had a workflow that was very much like feature branches without source control beforehand, you know, just kind of, you know, you want to integrate your database with your application development cycle, so just do what the app dev people do, ask them what they, you know, I know DBAs, you know, don't like to listen to us app dev, you know, people, but this is, you know, if you're bringing your stuff into our data store that we're, you know, we know get worth passion about get as you are about your relational model, um, you know, just just do do what we do in our organization and, you know, just jump in head first and do it. Yeah, no, I, and I, yeah, I, I can see um, some good reasons behind that because honestly, if you stop short of that, then you're not getting that benefit of actually knowing what version of the database corresponds to what version of the application and losing that. You're losing one of the big things that you can really get out of this. So stopping short, yeah, it might be a good way to get started, but yeah, you're, you're not going to get the full benefit of it if you do that. So we have some good questions coming in from um, one from Jason. Does version control allow you to hold changes from a junior DBA? for code or schema review um, by a project lead on the team? Oh, wait, hold it to, 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 to allow the junior to... Um, I, I, okay, so let, let me try to answer this. So if, if you're a junior DBA or SQL developer, yeah, you can make a change to your local version of the database, check it in, uh, either, you know, TFS use the, 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 the work set, the, the, the shell work set feature, I think it's called, or use the feature branch, uh, and then you can, you know, in your ticket system say, okay, I've done this, and then the senior develop the, the senior DBA or the senior developer could uh, check out your branch, um, you know, look at your, you know, either look at your changes, you know, if, if you're using like a Git Enterprise setup or, or just run your changes on the database, and you can have your little code review meeting, uh, and then, you know, he can reject stuff or make changes or send stuff back. So I think that's answering his question. I, I think... Um, I think so. Uh, yes, he says yes. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Jason. Uh, we also have a question about, um, we talked about the migration versus state. Is there an approach that um, implies more dependencies in a continuous integration or, or a continuous deployment process? Or does one of these approaches um, lend itself better when you're starting to think about CI and CD and trying to automate some of these um, database? I don't know if there's scope for clarification on dependencies there about what the, is it which one is in general is better for CI/CD, or is there actually a more specific thing about in that dependencies word that he means? I'm hoping somebody will type back. So let's go with which one uh, I guess lends itself better to CI/CD, and then if he replies, we can follow up with that as well. Okay, so if you're going to go with the continuous integration setup, um, then Basically, at that point, you've got to assume that your your CI server um, is not going to, you know, it, you've got to have one step where you push the button and you have all your 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 data changes. So you probably go with a state based solution because CI you blow usually in CI you blow away what you had before. And if you really want to get the benefit of CI, then you have to blow away everything, start anew, and you know, run your. I guess you'd, you'd have database unit tests with like you know, or um, just have your have a set of you know unit or functional test that, that actually call your physical database to prove that works. And then so CI is going to force you to have something closer to pure state-based. I think the migration-based solution is dealing with the fact, well, I have this running application uh, on my, you know, and migration, more dealing with, I have this running application, I have this running data, people are going to get a little mad if I blow up like, you know, all these years of, of, of data and, and, and their stuff when, when we go to do the deploy. So the migrations is dealing with that reality, where on your CI, you know, your, 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 your CI setup is going to be more of, okay, well, I'm just going to blow away everything and put a new thing in. 
unless I guess you're Etsy, because I believe Etsy actually does CI to production, and every time someone commits to Git, um, it actually gets blows everything away, puts it on the server, which is uh, I've I've never been in a shop that's been that brave. Um, yeah, I, I mean, um, it's, I mean, CI server. So first of all, migrations you can certainly just blow everything away and spin migrations up from scratch as well. You can replay a, a set of things, and sometimes even you know people doing this will rebaseline so that they can still replay somewhat faster. So they're going to create you know a bunch of create statements and then sort of take it from a known point. Um, so I don't think that there's necessarily a problem with um, migrations in the CI setup. And as you say, you certainly want to know sometime before you get to production what the actual script is going to be. And so even with state, you, you will need to have a point where it materializes into a script that you can see and know exactly what is going to happen on the database. Very few people will just go ahead and let SSDT make changes directly to the database without actually looking at what those changes are going to be. Um, and trying to test that in a uh, production-like environment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I guess that's the thing, is that in order to do CI or CD, you need those that testability of changes. You need to have the change being made in exactly the same way going through the environments. And you, know, you, you will need to materialize a script for that in order to make sure you get that rehearsal aspect of it going all the way through so that it, the change is being made in the same way to the earlier environments as to, the, to, to production eventually. So I've seen, for the record, I've seen both work. I've seen both actually take place like in anger in big, you know, meaty scenarios. Um, so you know, either one can can do it. I think, um, but that that rehearsal of changes aspect makes scripts a little stronger as you're getting to the downstream environments after CI. That sounds like you're doing a lot of to massage that migration script as you go. I mean, so it, it sounds like if you go up with a migration-based solution, you're sort of expecting to have problems the first time when you go from like, you know, dev to QA or whatever. Like it, it's not like that. You're expecting to, but you want to give a chance for that to happen as early as possible, right? You don't want that to wait until you're about to get to production to find that out. Um, the idea is those tight feedback loops to give you that, that benefit. But I guess CI would break more if the build would, would yeah. break more integration basically. Yeah, and that's the idea rather than production breaking more. <laughs> <laughs> catching catching it early and being able to uh, know what you just changed and fix that. Um, we talked about um, putting the schema in source control and kind of this way to, to work with uh, the schema, either state-based or, or migrations-based to make changes to the schema, but um, what else you know, should be in source control when it relates to the database? Um, I, mean, I think there, there's always going to be static um, tables uh, for, for so the static data. Um, you know, in the Microsoft world, SSDT, you know, had that post-deploy script. Um, there are some very nice tools. Um, I know uh, someone on Twitter, I know the Twitter who I run the uh, the pass app dev uh, virtual chapter with, Ed Elliott, he had a nice tool to plug in to generate these nice merge statements for, for, for your static data. Uh, but the other thing is, is I, I, I do think, you know, the database configuration, like the recovery mode, uh, whether it's trusted or not, um, basically everything but the uh, but the secrets like the, the the keys you know you you, you know if you're using an, uh, if you're using passwords and, and the keys but basically every kind of configuration that isn't a secret like your password and your your keys um, which you know should 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 be in there you should you should you know you should it, it should take care of all that stuff um, you know the the LUN drive and the path to the MDF files the LDFs that's and is this to have like repeatability across the environments and making sure they're configured the same or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, it should, yeah, it should be that, yes. Um, you know, and that does get a little hairy. What do you do when you have this very complex production database uh, split across and um, I just want to build it on my laptop with, with uh, you know, one, uh, you know, with, with, with just one, one MDF and everything going in there. So uh, that, that does get to be a little bit of a, you know, a, a little bit of a problem there, so that that's where you have to sit there and um, that that's a not solve. That's not a, a completely solved problem, uh, you know. But uh, and that's where contention happens. You know that 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 that's a big that's a big point where like you know we're we're, we're out there yet. We have to really think about tool makers. Like you guys have to think about that. We have to think about how to use the tools to to work around that. There's no obvious answer. Um, what about um SSIS? Uh, I am not an SSIS guy. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, actually, no, I would. I, I, I think with with Bimble and the fact that you can script stuff out more, and and from what I've heard, the the uh, the SSIS XML files are a little more mergeable and and stuff. Um, it, it seems it seems we're getting there. Um, what I would suggest, the, the, yeah. What I what I would suggest is don't be afraid to use the command line and to use the merge tools. Uh, which, which actually, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching a, a Git training of to, to, to half dev people, and I'm going to just spend, even though they use, they use a, uh, an ID, I'm going to spend half the day teaching them how to use the command line. Because where things are not there, use the command line. Don't be afraid to read the manual diffs and edit the highway arrows yourself to get there. Because in the end, it's just a bunch of XML text, and, and uh, that's what I've done in the past. And I've had the few times I had to deal with SIS, uh, and, and the merges didn't work well. Great. Um, we have a question from David. His company uses Team Foundation Server for applications. Uh, how would he get started using TFS for databases? Um, I think you just, so you, I, what I would do, I would just start with, uh, oh, set up SSDT if you don't have that installed. I mean, I think it comes with even Visual Studio Pro with the free download. Uh, point it at, you know, your production, you know, do this, uh, make a new empty database project, go to schema compare, point it at your database and just reverse uh, engineer it down and then try to uh, you know, play that in push that to push that to um, the uh, yeah, uh, push push to, to your QA site um, and uh, yeah see what the differences are and then just kind of go from there I mean that and if you're in uh, SSMS instead because that's only going to be good if you're in Visual Studio if you're in SSMS instead then the red gate tools will cover that case for a similar kind of thing. Um, yeah, and just hook it up. Oh, we've got a, a David joining us. Um, yeah, hook it up. You just point a database at you know the tool, either SSDT or or one of our things at the database, and you know link to source control, and then away you go. Um, in fact, I think um, David is here to give a demonstration of using the Redgate approach later. So if you okay. want to actually see that a bit, maybe maybe hang on towards the end. Yeah, we have. Um Ten more minutes of discussion and Q and A, so keep your questions coming. Um, and so, um, just one thing I'd like to say, though, with the if if you use SMS and, and you're moving to source control, now would be a good time to start doing SSDT. Um, you know, um, I mean, even I still use SMS for for you know more administrative tasks or running ad hoc queries or whatever. But um, first of all, you you know you can with Visual Studio just run your ad hoc queries. There is a solution explorer. Uh, Try to do that for a week where you don't use SMS, you know, SSMS unless something big in production breaks and you just need, you know, that comfort and the familiarity. Um, and and it's a good time to switch because most of the stuff works anywhere. And when you're doing your schema design, you know, that you'll you'll find SSDT works better. And in the end, you'll end up probably using both tools, but you'll end up saying, okay, I want to make a table. Do let me do an SSDT where where the, the IntelliSense and stuff is really suited, you know, for that. Um. Thank you, guys. So we talked a little bit about, um, you know, adopting database version control and that tooling is, is getting better. Um, what are some of the other barriers? So, so how do we get, you know, teams and, and management buy-in and how do we, you know, start making this adoption of, of version control for the database, you know, as a requirement, as you know, just part of standard normal processes uh, for database development. Yeah, I mean, it, it's without a doubt the hardest part of getting it in is the, the team changes rather than the actual kind of technical uh, aspects of it. Um, and, you know, it, it does obviously depend on where you're starting from, but people need to see the value early. They need to see that it's solving that problem that, you know, we we're talking about at the very beginning, whatever that thing is that your organization feels, if that's the thing that, you know, your, your job is to make sharing changes better between your development teams, then that's the thing to make sure that people are comfortable with and see working in practice very early. Um, but if it's not tied to, you know, something that either the business has an interest in or even the team as an individuals have an interest in, then it's not going to bet in. Yeah, um, I think another, another thing that, that, that ties in adoption is if you want to um, do a bottom-up adoption where, where you're more of a junior guy, um, I think the tool being kind of more uh, built in, you know, it's built into the professional level, you know, at the, at the lowest few level Visual Studio, um, at you know, and, and also just the free SSDT, um, that that gives you an easier early adoption than if you want to go to more 
uh, you know, a better solution you know, than back in the day. In the 2008 days, you had to have a special version of Visual Studio database deploys, or you had to, you know, if you weren't already a Redgate shop, you know, convincing people to uh, buy, you know, Redgate, you know, schema error source control or, or one of the other tools. Now it's a different world. If you're in Java, you just have Liquibase that just works. You have Visual Studio at the low SKU levels. Um, you know, you have, you know, um, kind of, you know, the, the Redgate tool has been, you know, proven. Um, so I think culturally it's a lot easier to also do from just the bottom up where a junior guy could just start doing it um, and, you know, ask for forgiveness as opposed to permission as well as doing it from the, the top down kind of way, you know, getting the organization management to buy into it. We have a question from Armanda about which tools do you recommend for version control? I don't know we already have a little bit of that. I guess the, the one thing we haven't talked about, we talked about SSDT, we talked about the Redgate tools, um, we haven't talked about the various uh, script-based approaches, and there are quite a lot of things out there that you can use for that that are open source, uh, that have various levels of functionality in them. They're you know, Flyway, Roundhouse, DB app, I mean, all of those things you can try. And then if you want that Visual Studio integration, something like ReadyRoll, um, which takes it to that next level of functionality and brings some of the, the sort of uh, generating script part from SQL Compare into it. Um, so I, I think, yes, we, we've covered the, the one side of the state-based tools, but it's worth mentioning those, um, the, the migration-based approaches, the script-based approaches as well. I guess I was also thinking, like, what uh, source control system? Um, so I guess if their application development team is using something, it's best to start with that, but if you're starting completely from scratch, do you have any recommendations? I mean, it, 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 that, that's one of those decisions that depends on, you know, how a team likes to work, and I think the biggest determinator, the determ determining factor is what is already in place, as you say, in place in the organization. Um, you know, the Git is becoming a bit of a default choice for people who don't want to think about the that decision very much, um, but that's not necessarily going to be the right way to make that judgment for you. Yeah, you got to do for, and if, if you want to succeed, you got to do what's right in your organization. Um, you know, I, I, I would never go in, you know, if I was, you know, going in as a consultant to a, a company that's, you know, pure Visual Studio, pure Microsoft, you know, didn't didn't buy third-party tools or whatever, I'm going to suggest a very, um, you know, I'm going to set the very SSDT solution. I'm probably not going to try to sell, okay, maybe you should do Git. Maybe I'll sit there and say, well, Git is built into TFS now, so you can do that. Uh, if I'm going into a shop where everyone's using, you know, on Unix using VI and whatever, uh, I'm going to go with a very command line approach. If I'm going to a Java shop, I'm going to see, you know, this all Eclipse. I'm going to say, okay, um, I haven't used Liquibase much, but Liquibase ties into Eclipse, uh, mm -hmm. so let you know, let go with, you know, go with that. If, if you know, if you want, you know, if, if you want to get the source control, you know, get, getting getting your database in source control is, is a very good thing, and that's probably more important than you should make the tools so what is that going to be a success and, and match the culture of the organization because any of these approaches, you know, they, there are different pros and cons, but um, any of the approaches will work if you have someone that, you know, is comfortable with that that kind of tooling. So, so make the tooling match what they already use. Is, is yeah, I guess the one additional thing I'd throw in is that the you know the, the more popular and growing version control tools are the ones that the database tools vendors, Microsoft included, are targeting a little bit more of their effort towards. So you, you know you probably want to back a winner on this one because the eventual tooling for you is going to be a bit stronger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Don't don't go with Perforce or <laughs> CBS. <laughs> I didn't want to name any names, but you know. <laughs> Um, so we have we have five minutes before we jump over into our demo. I guess um, we'll start with Elizabeth. Just one thing that you want you know people to take away today when it comes to, to database version control. Um, uh, let's see. One thing to take away. That's a that's a tough one because there's so much richness in this area. Um, you know, I guess it comes down to. to do it. it. It's seen as being, you know, sort of an upfront cost that's a burden on a team from the side of, you know, if you haven't taken that leap yet. And then once you're on the other side, I think it's very, you know, typical to look back and say, how did we ever survive without it? So even though it, it seems like a leap into the unknown, it actually, it's not, um, it's not untrodden ground. You're not kind of needing to invent a whole solution from scratch. And there's some relatively straightforward steps you can take to at least go, go down this and then become that guy on the other side looking back at the idiot you were before. 
And Justin, um, anything you'd like people to take away today? Um, okay, um, I mean, I think Elizabeth made the, the basic point. Yeah, this is, um, I, I think my, my final thing, though, is, uh, you know, there, there's no perfect solution. We've gotten much better at this. Uh, you know, the tools do work, and but just, just kind of jump into it, give it a try, uh, and then when you run into problems, you know, look at solving your specific problems. Don't try to don't don't try to over plan this. Just try to you know kind of do you know just 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 do it. Um, and 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 you know look when the problems come up, you know deal with those. There's plenty of answers on Stack Overflow. The community's there to help you. I guess that's a point, is that there's a real richness of people who have gone down this path now. You know, it's not like you, you will find answers out there to the questions you have as you go along, whereas you know, five years ago, you're kind of on your own. Yeah, I mean, there have been the pioneers, that, 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 and there have been the settlers. You know, now, you know, this is not the Oregon Trail, like, you know, this is, this is like buying out in California today. Like, it's, it's people, yeah, you know, you're, you're <laughs> whatever. Yeah. No wild animals you're going to encounter. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I am I am going to duck out now and let David actually get set up. I don't know if you want to continue a little bit of conversation with Justin while I fade into the background and hand over to David. Um. Great. So David's joining us to, to demo SQL Source Control. Again, it's an add-in into SQL Server Management Studio to allow you to source control your database in your existing version control system, whether that be Git, TFS, uh, subversion. Um, and Justin, I guess one more question for you. Just when do you think this is going to start, you know, being mainstream and, and actually, you know, become as normal as, you know, database backup practices and kind of really get embedded into to, um, the database development? Um, I think it's, I, I see it as very main, I see it as very mainstream already on several fronts. Um, I think in the Microsoft shop, it's just, um, I think any time a new, and any, I think the next time in any Microsoft uh, kind of shop or, or big job enterprise shop that manager decides we're going to start a new big project and we're going to uh, throw everything away, um, I think people, once they look at the tools, they're going to say, okay, we're going to, we're just going to version our database because that's just going to be kind of the thing to do. Um, I think in the smaller shops, I, you know, I think in the more DevOpsy shop, this is going to happen the, uh, as development ops comes together, you know, that version control uh, discussion happens in a very different way, uh, but you're, you know, they're going to get, the DBA, they're going to get like the pressure on two fronts, the op, the regular traditional sysadmin, the developers, they're both using version control, uh, so the um, the database guys are going to get that pressure that way. Um, I think we're, we're, it's just, you know, we'd like to think of ourselves as a very fast-moving industry, but there's a lot of, like, legacy code out there, people, you know, there are people still using, you know, source safe, um, and, and it, it's just people, it, 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 right now it's just the, uh, you know, as old code dies, old practice dies, um, you know, the, the, the newer, you know, people people will slowly migrate in that direction, you know. Um, I, I think it, it, it's just time. I think we, we, you know, every time a new project starts up, I see database source control being part of that already um, from what I've seen. And it is sometimes easier to try this on a, a greenfield new project, uh, put these practices in place, see some successes, and then start rolling it out to uh, to other teams. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I tr yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's hard for me to come into a, a big project if, if if I'm just you know one hired gun and a team of ten and, and you know putting stuff in source control. Uh, when it's a small project, I can do that and, and do that bottom up effectively that way. But if you know like it, like the next week I'm going to a place that's starting from scratch and we're we're actually being part of mentoring them and, you know, using Git, uh, using uh, a schema management um, team, that's going to be actually uh, DB2 and PHP on, on the IBM I. So that's going to be a, a, a completely different setup from many of the tools we've talked about. But, you know, since we start from scratch, we can sit there and say, okay, this is what you should do, and they'll be more open to that um, because it, it, it's new. Great. So I'm just going to hand control over to David now. And, David, if you want to share your screen. Um we can uh, take a look at SQL source control from Redgate. Cool. So can you see the screen, Stephanie? Yes, thank you. Cool. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick demo of the Redgate SQL source control product. So the Redgate SQL source control product is an add-in to SQL Server Management Studio, and it's not actually a source control system itself. What it does is it talks to your existing source control system that you've got set up in your organization. 
and that might be Subversion or TFS or Git or GitHub or Mercurial or the list goes on. We support lots and lots of systems. And in fact, in the last month, we've made it even better with much improved Git support. So we're an add-in to Management Studio. And what we do is we make it really easy to source control your database. So we go through, so what the application does behind the scenes is it scripts out all the objects in your database into, into text files. It then stores those text files in your existing source control system. And then we've also got a get latest tab where you can get things back out of the source control system and into a database. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you kind of the most, um, the best features about the product as quick as I can, because we've only got like five, 10 minutes. So the scenario that I'm going to go through to show these features is a new developer joining the team. So, and that's what I'm going to show. So let's say I'm a new developer and I'm joining the team. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a blank database just for me. So if I execute that script, we can see we've now got a blank database just for me, and there it is. So this is my database. So uh, the SQL Source Control product supports two ways of working. The first is where each developer has their own database, and they use the SQL Source Control product to share changes between them and also via the Source Control system. And we also support a shared model of working, which is where all the developers connect the same database and SQL Source Control talks to the Source Control system to keep a history on audits of who's changing what. Um, today I'm going to show you the dedicated approach where each developer has their own database, but we support both. Um, so if you're working in a shared way, we support that too. So here is my dedicated database. And the first thing I need to do is to link it to Source Control. So this is going to tell our uh, our SQL Source Control product, where this is located in the Source Control system. And as you can see here, we support uh, Git, and we support Subversion, and we support Team Foundation Server, and we um, support a whole bunch of things. Uh, right now, I'm going to uh, link it to Subversion, uh, because that's what we're using for the demo today. So I'm just going to copy paste um, the um, where my Subversion server is, and we talked about the development models earlier, and today we're going to go through with the dedicated database. So if I click link, that is, uh, that's all we have to do to tell the Redgate SQL Source Control product where in Source Control our database is located. So you can see the icon over here has changed to green, and this gives you that visual indicator that the database is linked to Source Control. The SQL Source Control product has got two tabs. Uh, there's the Commit Changes tab and a Get Latest tab. So the Commit Changes tab shows us everything in our database that isn't in Source Control yet. And obviously that's blank because there aren't any objects in the database. And the Get Latest tab shows the opposite. It shows everything in Source Control which is not in our database yet. And we can see we've got 143 objects here. And this is, um, and we can see we've got uh, store procedures, tables, views, functions. We've also got in this list some static data as well. So as well as source controlling the scheme of the database, like this table here with its create table statement, we also have uh, some static data, which is the insert statement for this table. And that's because we obviously want to know who's changing the list of countries in the world, and we want to have the ability of the source control system to audit the changes of those um, list of countries. So all I need to do to populate my database with the latest things from source control is to make sure the objects are selected, which they are, and then click the Get Latest button. So what this is, so what SQL Source Control product is doing is it is updating my database to have the latest version of all of the objects from source control. Uh, the tab refreshes, and now there's nothing in the Get Latest tab because I'm completely up to date. And you can see here in the Object Explorer that it has been updated with all the objects which are now in the database. So that's how easy it is to link the database and then get a hold of the latest copy of the database schema and the static data from source control. So at this point, we can now make a change to the database. So I'm going to change this store procedure here. So we've got a select star here. So I'm just going to remove that star by using the tab feature in SQL prompt, which doesn't seem to be working. Not quite sure why. Great, there we go. Just had to press Control shift d for SQL Prompt to register the database because we changed some objects in it. So that star has now uh, been changed, and here I can click Execute. So what we're doing here is we're making a change to the database by writing with SQL and then executing it. Our product also supports making changes by the designers as well. So let's uh, create a new table with some columns. So we might have, um, I'm 
just for now, I'm going to put ABC as the column names just to show you as an example. But obviously, in practice, this could be a real table that you're adding to your database. So what we've done here is we've made change to the database using the query window and using the designers. If I now go to the commit changes tab in SQL Sort Control, I can see all of the changes that I've made to my database, which aren't yet in source control. And the way this is generated is the SQL Source Control product analyzes the database, analyzes source control, it analyzes the latest thing you've got, and it compares them all, and it's come to the conclusion that these are the objects that we've changed. And so it doesn't matter whether I change them with the designers or the query window or by using any other um, uh, tool for database development. The crucial thing is that the database has changed, and so we've spotted it. And so what we're seeing here is this is the brand new table, which doesn't exist yet in source control, which is why this side is blank. And obviously, it does exist on my database, and it's a new object. And then this store procedure has been edited. So we can see that's what it, that exists in source control at the moment, the select star. And over here, we can see that all of the columns have been expanded, and it's an edit. We've also got the last change by column here, which tells you who was the last user who changed this object. And the reason why it's showing up as Redgate is because I'm connecting to the SQL Server as the user account Redgate, as you can see up here. Obviously, in a shared database, that would be the user account who last made the change. And so that feature is really useful on shared databases so that you're not committing objects that other people are midway through working on. And on dedicated databases, it provides a way for you to just double check that no one else has kind of changed anything on your database. And it's definitely um, all, pretty much all version control systems uh, want you to type a comment in describing your commit. Um, so that's what we type in the comment box here. So change the store procedure and add a table. So that's how easy it is to, uh, to type in a comment. And then the next thing I have to do is just click the commit button here. And the SQL source control product has talked to the subversion server, but in the general case, it will talk to whichever server you're using and it's committed those objects to source control, and the commit tab is now empty because there's nothing to commit and completely in sync with source control. And the get latest tab is empty as well because there's nothing to get because I'm also in sync with source control. So we've seen how easy it is for a new person joining the team to link their database, to get all the things, to make a change to the objects, and to commit those changes to source control. So for the final bit of the demo, we're going to see how easy it is for another one member of their team to be able to get those changes. So let's pretend for a second I'm Grant and I've got my own dedicated database. If I go to my Get Latest tab as Grant, I can see the two objects which I've just changed as David. And that's because when we started the demo today, Grant's database was already up to date with source control. So this is why when I created the blank database, the Get Latest tab was literally full of everything. And that's because the database was uh, completely empty and we had to get all the things. Whereas when we started the demo today, Grant's database already has lots of stuff in it. So he doesn't need to get every object. He just needs to get the new objects which have changed. And so what we can see here is we can see that table which has been created, and we can see the store procedure which has been changed as well. So this is, um, makes it really easy to move changes between, between the developer's databases, which makes it really easy to work in this dedicated way. Um, this shows this tab shows the cumulative effect of all of the changes that have been made since you last got this object. If you want to see an item by item breakdown, you can just right click and do view history. And this tells you all of the individual changes which have been made to the store procedure. So we can see we've changed V2 to V3, we've removed the comments, and then we changed it to V4, and then this is the star. Because Grant was already at this revision 72 here, the commit tab, so the get latest tab just shows the latest one. But if there were, if Grant had, say, come back from a holiday or if there had been lots of changes, the Get Latest tab would show the cumulative effects. But he can see the individual breakdowns here, including who's doing it and when they're doing it, and the commit comments for the reasons why they're doing it, as well as what other files they're changing in that commit. So that makes it really easy for you to code a few things and see what the people in your team are up to. To get the change in the database is as simple as pressing the Get Latest button. The database is updated, the get latest tab is blank, commit tab is blank, so you have any changes. So it's that easy for Grant to get up to speed with the changes that I've made, and now he can build on top of my changes by making further changes to those objects. So that's pretty much the two most important tabs of SQL Source Control, commit and get latest. Commit lets you send changes to the source control system, and get latest gets them back out. Setup is just used to set stuff up. We've also got an object locking feature, which is really useful for shared databases. So you can lock an object so only you can change it, which uses a DDL trigger on the SQL Server to prevent other people being able to change the object until you unlock it or until they steal your lock. 
And then we've also got a migrations feature, which we is designed to help SQL Source Control bridge the gap between just using a state-based approach and using a migrations-based approach as well. So it allows you to mix and match the two approaches. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of work that's going on at the moment um, for migrations um, for a new approach that WebGate is considering for it, which is in an alpha release at the moment as well at the moment. So that's pretty much SQL Source Control. Um, in terms of what's happened recently, we've added much better Git support. So for people who use Git, there's all, as well as being a commit button, there's also a push button on this tab. And we are about to do some work on improving the performance. It's already pretty fast, but we're planning to make it even faster for people with tens of thousands of objects in the database. Thank so you. Stephanie's just told me that time is running out. So mm -hmm. I'm going to hand uh, back to Stephanie now. Great. Thank you so much, David. And there's actually four or five questions that came in. If you could follow up with them and if those users want to hang on uh, for a little bit to get those questions answered. And I just want to um, uh, share the screen so we have some final thoughts um, about uh, thanking Justin and Elizabeth for their time today. Thank you, David, for the demo. And also, if you need any more information, please email us at dlm at redgate.com. We're really happy to help answer any additional questions or, or if you have, um, you know, if you've put any of these tools in place, we'd love to hear about how you get on with them. We also have additional free webinars. So again, this was the seventh in the series, but all our previous webinars uh, and articles and free trials of all our tools. Uh, SQL Source Control has a 28-day free trial. It also comes with a uh, local subversion repository, so you can try it out without um, uh, without needing to set up any kind of permissions in your existing source control system, so you can try it on your own database. And we also offer full one-day workshops that are hands-on um, around SQL source control. Uh, these are all across the US, the UK, um, and we also can come on site to give you those workshops as well. Uh, we're on Twitter at Redgate, so please follow us and tweet and let us know if you have any questions. Again, thank you, Justin, Elizabeth, and David, and uh, we look forward to next month. Thank you so much. I'll keep the webinar going just so David can finish up with any of the questions. If you do have some more questions, please type them into the GoToWebinar panel. Um, I will stop up the recording at this time and just feel free to, to exit out of the GoToWebinar if you're not waiting for a response to one of your questions. Thank you so much, guys.